In my everlasting quest for analytical instrument, I came across this LCMS combo on eBay and decided to try my luck with this equipment. It was sold in 2003 for over $100,000, but after 22 years, I bought it for pennies on the dollar, saving it from destruction as a second-hand equipment. Back in college, I did not always pay attention in organic chemistry class, so I am not exactly sure how I can benefit from this machine, mostly used for peptides and uh, huge molecules like uh, proteins. But the inner working might be good enough for some interesting experiment in isotopic separation and inorganic stuff. This is the Thermo Finnegan Decca XP Plus, meaning it has a bigger separating power than other previous models. This is a very heavy unit and it came with its auto sampler, PDA, manuals, MS pump, two ion source, the PC and software for a complete LCMS setup. So how does it work? As for the MS part, the sample is injected here. There is two main ionization mode to choose from depending on what molecule you are interested in. Both ion source were included in the sales, but I purchased more just in case. Okay, so two main ion source, the ESI and the APCI. The ESI for electro spray ionization is a very popular choice for medium to high polarity molecules and works great for large molecules with higher masses, aka biochemistry stuff. The APCI for atmospheric pressure chemical ionization works for all sorts of polarity, but does better with the lower masses. ESI has trouble ionizing. ESI is better for heat sensitive compound with a low volatility when the APCI is more attractive for for single charge ion and less sensitive to flow and pH changes and tolerates a wide range of matrix. Basically ESI is for delicate sensitive stuff and APCI for everything else. Both of these methods are said to be soft ionization as opposed to the heavy electron bombardment called hard ionization in the GCMS. With this analogy, if APCI is the hammer, the electron ionization in the GCMS is the dynamite. Understand the biochemist would strongly disagree with me here. In the ESI mode, the sample goes through a capillary tube held at a higher voltage of a few thousand volts and is sprayed at right angle of this cone. Why a right angle? To limit interference from neutral molecules. The distance from the cone can be set in two axes and a schema cone pre-filter the samples for ions to enter into the instrument. In the APCI mode, the sample is sprayed inside this cavity here and heated to a few hundred degrees and then meet this needle held at a high voltage before being introduced in the instrument. In both cases, a constant stream of nitrogen is critical for a good even spray and to carry the ion to the entrance of the mass spec. At this point, the molecules are supposed to have a single extra positive charge, so the spectrum would show a single peak for the total mass of the molecule plus one for the extra positive charge. That's what the high voltage is for. For example, caffeine here is seen at mass 195 instead of its 194 accepted mass. Right on the inside, the pressure is in the low 10 minus 3 tor. The ion mean free path allows them to be accelerated towards the ion optic here before entering the first quadrupole. This quadruple uses an arrangement of four rods under a DC and AC voltage at variable frequency. The electric field resulting from this setup allows for only one mass of ion to pass through and get to the other end. By changing the frequency and voltage, we can scan through a wide range of resonating mass to charge ratio and get a mass spectrum from low to high. At the exception of the ionization mode, the mass spectrum is working at this point, just like the one in the GCMS. Now, there's a second quadrupole, in this case an octopole lined up in the path of the ions. But why would you have another mass selection device? Well, you see, the mass ionization in the ion source from earlier yield a molecule with an extra positive charge, and that will give a single peak on the uh, mass spectrum we call the caffeine example from earlier. There is many molecules with the exact same mass that could match this compound, so how could we know what it is. The first quadruple is a rough mass filter, but the resolution can be refined further for sharper peaks. This is a necessary step for the following fragmentation in the ion trap and collision cells. Basically, the cell breaks down the uh, molecule further so we can determine the fragment origin and reconstruct its nature. This is done by passing the stream of ion through a monoatomic inert gas like helium. The high speed of the molecule heating helium atoms breaks it up in predictable ways so the fragment can be identified. The ion trap concentrates them for a predetermined amount of time before sending everything it collects to the detector. I know this is a complicated process, but there is a reason why these instruments are used in forensic investigation, pharmaceutical formulations, food science, and so much more. Now, if a pre-separation by chromatography is performed before the mass spectrometer analysis, we now have a way to see a lot of shit. Making all this work together is a different story. The auto sampler of photodiode array communicates with the computer using an ethernet connections on a dedicated network card. The pump, however, uses a regular RS-232 and the mass spectrometer 
Spectrometer has its own separate card on a different network. The MS has its own onboard computer, and getting this 22-year-old to wake up took some spare parts and a lot of patience. The onboard battery was of course dead and one of its boards was fried. eBay came to the rescue and I was able to get these two PC to talk to each other. Finally, getting two instruments to talk to a computer was difficult enough, but five instruments was just ridiculous. The PDA needed a set of new light bulbs. The calibration worked great using the inner holmium oxide filter wheel. I replaced the column in the auto sampler. The solvent tray was missing. The pump had to be thoroughly flushed and one channel was clogged. I also replaced both low and high voltage power supply in the MS. One of the turbo pump cooling fan was broken. Once all this crap was fixed, and after many, many failures to determine the correct flow rate, solvent ratio, pressure, voltage, method development was tedious and time consuming, and when I finally started to get some decent results, the computer died. Oh look! A 23 year old refusing to work. I replaced the PC with a new Windows XP computer, reloaded all the software, drivers, backed up data from the hard drive, reconfigured network connections, worked out all the kinks and issues again to get to a good tune but still failing mass calibration. The whole 250 milligram solution used for this calibration is of course off limits for residential delivery, so I had to get creative to bypass this corporate bullshit. Liability. For a time I used a weak solution of cesium iodide in formic acid here. In positive ionization cesium shows up nicely at its expected mass and so does iodine in negative polarity mode. Personally, I would prefer to use APCI, but this consumes a lot of nitrogen. Sure, it's cheaper than helium, but I already made several trips for a refill, and this is getting very annoying. As of December 2025, this is where it stands. I thought about turning this whole thing into an ICPMS, but I'm not sure how to keep the skimmer cone cool. A regular propane torch aimed away from the entrance does generate enough ion to be detectable, but this is not a reliable, steady stream of ion and can't really be used for analytical work. So let me know in the comment what you think I should do with this. Uh, setup. Right now, the HPLC side is not working, so I could turn this into another ion chromatograph system, but given the low interest this generated in the past, I have to reevaluate that option. Before we turn the page on 2025, I'd like to uh, thank all of you watching this channel and for your continued support through Patreon, messages, collaborations, and subscriptions. This year has been a difficult and challenging one for many creators, including myself. My GCMS detector has recently died, and I am not sure I can dig up a new one anytime soon. Sure, I know what I'm getting into with these old instruments, and fixing them is part of the fun. However, the constant fight with corporate to get the simplest replacement part and chemicals is reaching a critical point. In addition, YouTube has no interest promoting small channels. I recently found out my uh, Skinwalker debunking video was seeing several commercial interruptions despite not being monetized. Also, let me prove the gullible, the scammers, and the undecided viewers that I'm not trying to make money or taking advantage of a popular show or movie by not monetizing my video and not allowing commercials. If you get commercial interruption, that would be to YouTube benefits and you should complain. YouTube does not pay creators until the monthly view reaches $100. So if a channel generates $99.99, YouTube pockets 100% of the ad revenue. At least that's how it works for me. Let me know if it's different for you. Like many others who enjoy sharing their work with a community of enthusiasts, I have dedicated my time and finances for my own education, and YouTube has definitely facilitated the sharing of ideas, knowledge, and experience, and I'm deeply grateful for this opportunity. I have done many analysis for many people who offer to compensate me, which I always refuse because I enjoy the challenge. Learning and experience are far more valuable than cash in my eyes. Yeah, a little cheesy, huh? Sure, I like having disposable income like the next guy, but I am not constantly chasing it. And with that... So, this is probably not your first YouTube video, and you know what to do. Thumbs up if you like it, subscribe if you want, Patreon, bell, share. I hope to see you again on the next one, and thank you for watching. Damn it!